Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have an update on my spinning breed study. I have an update on my knee socks, toe up knee socks explorations. I have an update on my 1950s vintage raglan jacket. And I have an update on my reverse engineered sweater that is the, my next sweater project on the needles. So let's get started. If you are a fan of tidbits, which I certainly am, I don't have any this week in part because we lost internet connection earlier this week and we were out for several days. So typically the way I get my tidbits is just by monitoring my social media during uh, throughout the day. And since the only access to the internet I had was uh, on my phone and I really don't like to use the internet on my phone, I didn't really find that much this week, but tidbits will be back next week. This week, I was my fifth week of the breed study and the goal was to uh, spin and ply a dorset horn. I not only did that, but I also spun and plied a yarn called Eider, which is also known as the German white-faced mutton sheep. So I now have six yarns and all of them were, all of them started out as combed top and all of them were spun with a short forward draw and then with a two ply, except for these two. This one was carded first, uh, and then it was a, a woolen spun, use a long draw method. And for this one, I did a finer uh, spinning of my singles for uh, using the short forward draw, but for both of these, I used a chain plying method that creates a three ply. So it's really interesting to see the natural, the variation in, in natural colors. I'm becoming more used to a two ply yarn for one thing, um, but also I'm much happier just with the resulting yarns that I'm spinning than I was in the past when I think I had a tendency to create like really hard rope like yarn that wasn't fun to knit with. Now I haven't knit with any of this yet. Um, so my hope is since I've got, I'm ahead on my spinning that next week I can start uh, doing some kind of uh, knitting with these different yarns and see how, how they work out. Um, but I just wanted to give you that update on these different, on, on my um, spinning that it's going along. It's so much easier for me to just sit and spin now and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, and I've actually ordered a few more bobbins for my wheel because I only had four. I do have some storage bobbins, but I just wanted to have some more um, bobbins that I could be using um, in case I wanted to switch between a breed study or something else that was going to take longer. I wanted to be able to uh, to do that. So I ordered some more bobbins, which is exciting for me. That's just my, my brief update on what, what's going on with the breed study. So the past couple of weeks, I have been knitting a one single sock after the other in toe up. And I've been using different toes and heels, but one of the things I've been interested in is the shaping and fit of a knee sock and figuring out exactly what sort of, what, what amount of negative ease would work best for that. And so I, I've just been using kind of my own instincts as a very experienced uh, sock knitter in my understanding about negative ease and how that contributes to helping socks so I have to kind of figure this out. And I've been asking you guys if you have uh, any experience with knee socks and what you've done um, in order to keep them up. And in particular, I was interested in the amount of negative ease that maybe you had used. Now, several of you recommended Kate Atherley's book on custom socks. So I, I went to the textile center here in town the other day. Uh, the library is now open, like you can actually go in and look at the books. 
up until recently, you could reserve a book and then curbside pick up, um, get it on certain days of the week, but now you, I could actually go to the Textile Center Library. So I went there, I went to the sock section, I pulled out probably 10 different books on uh, socks that would include knee socks, including Kate's book, and I kind of just looked through to see what they were saying about keeping socks up and what they were saying about negative ease. And what Kate is saying is what I kind of figured out on my own that 20% uh, negative ease for the calf and maybe 25% for the, uh, the part where the cuff is that's right below the knee in order to make that snugger. Uh, that was kind of my sense was 20 to 25% negative ease and, and maybe going down a needle size for the ribbing at the cuff in order to make it even firmer. So I've been trying a few different things. So that was nice to see that, that we had the same uh, thinking on that. Now, a number of people commented that when they were growing up, especially the people in, there's a number of people in Europe who said, when, like one of them said when she was growing up, she had store-bought knee socks and also she had uh, knee socks that were knit by her grandmother. And in both cases, they were sloppy and they always fell down. And I think that was the person who mentioned that they used elastic bands to hold their socks up. And I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. And it wasn't until later that day, I was sitting at the kitchen table talking to my husband about knee socks and on the table, uh, we had, there were two of these that must have been around some mail or something like that that we'd gotten delivered. And I thought, oh, elastic band, that's what I would call a rubber band. Uh, and, and I just saw these and I thought, I had this memory of being a kid and wearing these kind of rubber bands, putting them up, up to my knee and folding my sock over and that that was how we kept our knee socks up. I just had never remembered that until I until somebody mentioned that and then I saw this on my kitchen table so that well that's interesting kids legs tend to be pretty skinny as well so they're probably more likely to fall down what I wanted to do was to knit a sock all the way up to my knee and then this was a case where I thought for collecting information a toe up sock was really informative because I, because I'm binding off at the top here, if things aren't working out right, I could take the bind off out and rip back and I could use a different amount of negative ease if I wanted. So what I wanted to do was to knit a sock that went all the way up to my knee and then I just wore it around the house for about two, two and a half hours of pretty, pretty much all after, afternoon. I was, I was sitting down, then I'd get up and I'd go downstairs and do some laundry or I'd fix myself some lunch. When I was going up and down the stairs and doing different things and I was very conscious that I'm not supposed to touch my sock because I did have a feeling early on that it had slipped a little bit. And I just wanted to see, is it going to keep slipping? So I'm gonna show you some photographs. Here's what, it, here's what it looks like when I just put the sock on. And then here's what it looked like about two and a half hours later. But it looked like this probably within 10 minutes. And it, and it never went down any further. So that's interesting to me. Uh, to me, it shows that I probably need a little bit more negative ease at the very top. Now, one of the nice things about a knee sock is that it is bigger around than your sock is down if you only make it so and the mid calf length where it, it, it ends right before the, the bulge of your calf muscle. So for me, I have a very long uh, heel diagonal. So the heel diagonal is that part that from where your heel hits the floor and then across to your instep, that, that circumference there. I have a high arch. And so, and that heel diagonal is like 12 and a quarter inches. And my socks are only seven inches in circumference when I'm making a regular sock. So that seven inch sock has to stretch to 12 and a quarter inches in order to get past my heel. But with a knee sock, because I have more room up here, this sock is, is closer to nine to nine and a half inches and it's very easy for it to stretch past my heel. I did not need, I feel like I needed to do any special sort of bind off for this sock. Like normally for a toe up sock, I would use what I call a half hitch bind off. It's a type of sewn bind off. I did a video on it. I think in December I'll link to up above and also down below. 
It's also called an outline stitch bind off, stem stitch bind off, uh, casting on, cast off. There's a bunch of different names for it. Two different processes to achieve the same result. And the, the one in Principles of Knitting by June Hemmons Hyatt, she calls it the half hitch bind off. Elizabeth Zimmerman's version is um, a slightly different process, process and I think is more difficult to do uh, than the version that June Hammond Hyatt does. But regardless, I didn't feel I needed a sewn bind off in order to get enough stretch for a knee sock. So I did a standard bind off because that will be easy to take out. So what I'm going to do next is take the bind out, um, bind off out, join the yarn, and I'm going to knit another, I don't know how many inches this is, couple, three inches of ribbing that will fold over. And my feeling is that because it's going to create two layers, it's going to squeeze things a little bit more. And then I'm going to see if that will stay up. And if it doesn't, then I know that I might need to do some more shaping above uh, the point where I get that um, final calf shaping. So I'm just playing around with things. But that, for me, the, the toe up is definitely an advantage in, in terms of trying to tweak this part up here in order to get a good fit. Once I figure out what I actually need, I wouldn't need to do toe up. I could do a cup down because I'd have the information I needed and in order to work it in the, in the reverse. So really, if, if I want to somehow use all of the yarn that came in the skein like I did in these solar system socks where it's a non-repeating pattern and I really did want to use all of the yarn, then I definitely would want to do toe up. The thing is about this particular skein is that the sock ends up at a weird place in the middle of my calf, which may not be the most ideal location uh, for uh, where a sock ends. And I, I probably could have gone with more negative ease or, or gone down a needle size for the ribbing for this particular sock because it does want to just slide down my leg just a little bit. It doesn't go down to my ankles, but it does want to just kind of go down a little bit. So all of this is just like a fact-finding mission. Now I did get a comment from one person who hadn't knit very many pairs of socks, but she had knit a pair of knee socks and she said they fit her really well. And she gave me the best information. She told me the pattern. She told me the, the gauge that the pattern called for and the stitch count so I could tell how big around the sock was supposed to be. She told me her measurements. So she told me what her calf and ankle measurements were so that I could compare the circumference of the sock to the circumference of her leg and I could calculate the amount of negative ease. And so that was really, really helpful. I was really curious about the particular sock pattern that she told me about. It was a Peyton's pattern it was from 1969. I'll put an image of the cover up here on the screen. And so out of curiosity, I uh, started Googling for it. And I did find a seller in the UK who had it for only a couple of pounds, but wouldn't ship to the US. But then I remembered, I am a member of the Knitting and Crochet Guild of the UK. And one of the, the, the benefits of membership is that they have the entire back catalog of all Peyton's patterns. And many of them are still under copyright. They're, they're less than 70 years old, so they're still under copyright. But Peyton's has given the guild permission to give members a personal copy, a digitized, you know, scanned copy of it. It's got watermarks all over it, so you can't like think, oh, I'm going to get all of these Peyton's patterns and then sell them on the internet. You can't do that. You shouldn't do that anyway. Uh, but I got the pattern and I was reading through. It was really interesting to see how it was constructed. And I got to the heel. And the heel was a type of short row heel using a technique that I had seen in short row heels uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And it's been a fascinating technique that I've been kind of playing around a little bit to, to see if I could figure out more exactly what the intent was based on how it's described. At some point, I will uh, do a demonstration of this particular uh, technique. 
But what's interesting to me was seeing that the, it was still in a stock in 1969, and it wasn't it wasn't a wrap and turn short row heel. When I learned to knit socks in like 2005, all short row heels were wrap and turn short rows. And there were people who had blog posts about how you could use a yarn over short row or how you could use Japanese short rows, or people were doing tutorials in different types of short rows. Um, but patterns, published patterns, we're always using wrap and turn short rows anytime there's a short row. So I have been wondering when wrap and turn short rows became popularized and like when they started showing up in sock patterns because I don't think socks were terribly popular to knit in like the 70s and 80s maybe and probably even into the 90s they weren't super popular and it wasn't until self-striping yarn became a thing that they really took off and then you start seeing really interesting uh, sock patterns for women because there weren't that many sock patterns for women before this either. Sometimes you'd see a knee sock or stocking pattern, but most of the sock patterns were for children, men, or they were sports anklets for women. So this is what I've been really interested in seeing is this change in sock patterns being sort of aimed at, at, at women's feet rather than at men's feet. Um, and I've been particularly interested in the short row heels. So any of you longtime sock knitters who have done short row heels forever, I would be really interested in knowing what kind of short row technique you used in your socks. Now I know if you're if you're from Germany, you probably were using what we call the German short rows or the the um, double stitch short rows. The, for the yo-yo heel or, or boomerang heel method. So I, I would expect to hear that from people in Germany, but I'm wondering about other parts of Europe and also in the United States, if you have a memory of when you started using short rows and were they wrap and turn short rows. I have a suspicion that wrap and turn short rows um, became sort of ubiquitous, at least for a while, because of the influence of Barbara Walker and Elizabeth Zimmerman, um, because they're like hugely influential in so many ways. But I really, I, I'm starting to think that, that it was about them. Because when I went to the textile center and was looking at these books, I did find a book that was published in, I think the 19, early 1990s by Priscilla Gibson Roberts. And she was showing a short row heel, but it was using yarn over short rows. It wasn't wrap and turn, which I thought was interesting. Uh, and so those kinds of books were sort of independent um, knitters and they were books, they weren't pattern leaflets. So I, I, my guess is if they were patterns that were produced by yarn companies, I would be interested in knowing how they were instructing to do short row heels because heel flap and gusset was still traditional, uh, easiest to modify and just really, really popular. So anybody who has any insight on that, I would appreciate hearing back from you. Oh, I promised that I would announce a date for the sock Q and A live stream this week. So it is going to be as the, the, the plan is right now and things could change, hopefully they won't. Um, Saturday, August 21st is the date. So that will be Saturday, August 21st here in the US in the afternoon, which means if you are in Australia or New Zealand, that might be Sunday morning for you. And again, if you have questions about socks and you don't think you'll be able to catch the live stream, you can leave those down in the comments and I will do my best to answer those in the live stream so that when you look at it later, at the recording later, then your question uh, could be addressed even if you weren't able to um, be there for the live stream. So last week I showed you that I had completed all of the separate pieces for my 1950s vintage raglan jacket. And I was talking a little bit about how the seaming was supposed to work. I wanted to show you a swatch I had done before I had ever cast on for the jacket itself, just to see how the seaming method that was recommended in the pattern, how it looked. 
and I found that swatch. Uh, so I'm going to show you what that seam is going to look like. I did start seaming the sides of my sweater. I haven't gotten up to the raglan seams yet. So I kind of wanted to show you the decision I made about the side seams. And then I also want to, to talk about a button selection for this particular sweater. So we're going to go to the overhead so you can see uh, what is going on currently with that project. Last week I couldn't find the swatch. This is the, the swatch that I initially did for the 1950s sweater when I wanted to see how the seaming technique would work along that raglan edge. Now, one of the things I did was I did, I think I did this swatch in the morning, first thing in the morning when I was drinking coffee. And then I did this swatch right here in the evening, probably after I'd had a beer or a glass of wine or something. And there are different gauges. I think I used different needles. I didn't write down what needle size and I'd done them, you know, 12 or 14 hours apart from each other. So this is, this is at a firmer gauge than this is. So it changes the look at the seam a little bit, um, but I think you can maybe get the idea. So this is, a flat seam, and I will demonstrate it at some point, but this is the, the result of the flat seam. So you, they're having you do what they call overcast or over stitching, which is another word for whip stitching, to connect um, stockinette edges. So this is a garter stitch pattern, but the, the selvages were in stockinette. Stockinette edges alternate between having what looks like a regular stitch and then one with a little uh, bump in it. And that's because you finish uh, this last stitch on one row and then you immediately knit back into it on the next row. And so that's why you get this alternating um, regular and bumpy stitch. And so the overcast uh, flat seam they want you to do is just enter in through that, that knot right there on the edge stitch on one edge and then go into the same to the corresponding knot ed, knot of the selvage on the other side of the seam. And then that gives you this kind of uh, flat seam. And again, it looks a little bit looser on the side because this is was knit at a looser gauge than this. But that's how that seam is joined right there. I started seaming this at my knitting group at the park this week. And the instructions actually said to use that same flat seam along the side edges as well, where, you, where it's all stockinette. I did try it. I did not love the look of it. And so instead I chose to use mattress stitch, which is really invisible uh, along the side when you have stockinette. So you do have the selvage on both sides um, is on the inside of the work. This is a jacket. It's not really an issue to have a seam like that. Um, and, I, and I really like the way um, that it looks on the right side of the work. The other thing that I did was I went out and I looked for buttons. I went to the, my favorite fabric store where I love to get buttons, hoping I could get vintage buttons, you know, I, that I would get lucky and find some 1950s buttons. But even if I didn't, I just really like vintage buttons. I think they're a lot more interesting. Um, but I did need to get a specific size. So as I was looking through the vintage buttons, um, I went over to the wall where they have all the regular buttons and um, where they're in tubes so you can get one out at a time. And I just wanted to see, you know, what would fit through this hole well. And so I tried three quarter inch, seven eighths and one inch. And I thought uh, the three quarter was a little bit too small, but the seven eighths worked well. So th this was the button that I used just to test. And it was just uh, sitting there on the counter next to it. And none of the vintage buttons were going to work. There was one set of vintage buttons that would have been perfect, but there were only five of them and I needed six. So this was sitting on the counter and the clerk said, I actually kind of like this button with it. And I said, oh, really? And so, you know, I, I actually liked the button too on its own, but I wasn't sure how it looked with the sweater. And so I laid them out uh, on the sweater. And, you know, I wasn't sure, but, you know, I was, you know, sh she seemed to think that they looked good. And I thought, okay, now I have to mention, I have, I've mentioned this before, I have some color vision deficiencies. So when I was looking at these, these looked like, reminded me of sandstone. They were kind of that goldy yellowish color of sandstone and they kind of had that texture as well on the surface. 
And then she said, yeah, I really like green with that color. And I, and I said, what? The buttons are green? And she said, uh, yes. And I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't notice in the light at the store. Now, whether you can see green or not, um, as photographed by my camera, beamed across the internet and viewed on your monitor, um, is, is unknowable. Whether you can see uh, the buttons the way they actually look uh, I can't tell you because all of those things can change the color. I just wasn't sure. So I came home and I showed these to my husband and he's like, I don't really have an opinion. So he didn't love them. He didn't hate them. He didn't, he's like, I don't have an opinion. So I asked on Instagram, I asked people for their solicited opinions and they had them. Many of them said they couldn't see that they were green in the way that it was photographed that day in the light that was available and the, what they were seeing on their screens. They couldn't see that they were green or maybe there was one of them they could tell it was green. Uh, but they definitely had opinions about uh, whether or not I should use them even if they couldn't see the color correctly. Some of the comments were they just didn't feel like they they went with the sweater. Like it didn't just, it, regardless of the color, they just didn't seem like they went with the sweater. I got comments like they seemed too bland um, while at the same time, uh, that was all that they were seeing was the buttons, the I was going to the buttons. So, uh, so there was this universal, not universal, some people thought it was okay, uh, a distaste for it. So I went back and I looked at the original pattern to see what kind of buttons were in the original pattern. And they were pretty basic kind of, if I, if I had access to mother of pearl buttons, those would have been acceptable. I couldn't find anything that would have that would have been done. So I went to Joanne Fabrics, it's a big box store here in the US, and uh, I found these buttons here, which very much to me look more in line with the original photo and more in line with a, a 50s type of thing. Now there are still some people who thought sh I should go with a different color. Some people thought I should try to match the color that is a nearly impossible feat. I think it's much easier. If you wanna match the color of your buttons to the, your yarn, you should probably start with the buttons and you're more likely to be able to find yarn that match the buttons than buttons to match your yarn. I have occasionally, one time, gotten buttons that matched exactly. It was serendipity, it was not intended. Anyway, I think these uh, work better for a 1950s jacket, particularly when you look at, at what was in the original photo. Because all of the knitting has been completed for my vintage 1950s and 1960s sweaters, and all I need to do on those is the seaming and the button band, the buttons and, and all of that finishing work, I don't have a sweater on the needles right now. So I've been working the past couple of weeks on returning to a sweater project I had I'd started working on last fall, not with the actual knitting. It was with the design phase. It was a reverse engineering uh, commercially knit sweater that I had that I really liked that was old and falling apart and I wanted to recreate it. So I'm going to um, talk about sort of how this project has evolved and um, my plans for it and um, getting started working on that project um, this week, in fact, I just actually cast on for it. I, I think it was yesterday or the day before. All right, so I wanna talk about the sweater that I started the process of reverse engineering a year ago. And I will link to the video that I did that it kind of explained the process of how you go through reverse engineering. Um, one of, this is a commercially knit sweater and it's probably 20 years old. It's got uh, stains on it. It's got a, a giant a hole in, in the elbow of the sleeve. I loved it. It's done its job, and I, but I, I really liked the silhouette of it, like the shape of it. I liked that it, the length of it, the pockets. I, I just really loved a lot of things about this sweater, and so I wanted to recreate it. Now, uh, so when I was examining the sweater initially, I was marking down all of the details in terms of measurements, how the cables were actually worked. I did some swatching to figure out how those worked. 
I looked at particular details of the sweater. How was this button band worked? How were the buttonholes created? What was the ribbing like? What were the details of the ribbing like? Uh, how big were the pockets? How did they interact with the cables? You know, all of that kind of thing. I looked at, at you know, I went to the inside of the sweater and looked at how the decreases were used to shape the armholes and the sleeve caps. And I looked at all of that and then I decided, what do I want my hand knit version to be like? Which elements do I really care about? And which ones are not as essential? So one of the things that I noticed immediately, and I'd never known it while, I'd never noticed it or cared about it while I was wearing the sweater, but one of the things that I noticed initially was that the cables on the front of the sweater are not mirrored. The cables all cross to the right. So one of the things that that has an effect on is how this cable interacts when it turns to plain stockinette, how that interacts uh, with the, uh, the neckline here, how this one crosses into the neck, yarn, neck uh, band or the uh, button band, and this one crosses away from it. Now, I always prefer to have mirrored cables, so that was one of my first things was, oh, I would, I would want to have these mirrored. That would be the first thing I would do. There's a problem with that. Uh, and that problem is, on the back of the sweater, there are five cables. So this central cable pa panel right here doesn't exist on the front of the sweater because on the front of the sweater we have a button band. So it's easy to mirror the cables on the front of the sweater, but you cannot mirror them on the back because what are you gonna do about the central panel? So um, when I was going through all of this last fall, there was one person who said, oh, well, why don't you take out that central one and just spread out the other so that you have four and then you can mirror them. Problem with that, every time you make a change in this original design, there is a cascading effect. So if I were to spread these out evenly, that means they would hit the shoulder at a different place than the cables on the front hit. So you wouldn't have this alignment at the top of the shoulder, it would be offset and that would destroy the design itself. So, um, so that was an issue and I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make a non-directional cable panel here. Like what could I do? Could I make something that zigged, zigged and zagged? And, and I, I wasn't coming up with anything. Uh, and, and so that was one of the reasons that I put this to the side is I couldn't figure out what to do in the center here in order to be able to mirror the cables on the back. So there, there are some other things about this sweater that I didn't like. So uh, let me move the camera angle so that you can see the pockets. So if we look at the pockets, what we can see is that we have one cable crossing here and then we skip until we come above the pocket. So we're essentially, we're missing one of the cable crossings here because of this ribbing right here. Um, the other thing is that the pocket is not as wide as those two cable panels. And so you have this uh, cable crossing here comes out to the right of that pocket over here. And, and because these are uh, non-mirrored cables, then you have um, this one coming around on the outside right here. So I, I, didn't, qu I didn't quite like that. I, I, uh, there, I wanted to, to somehow fix that or change that. And I, and I wasn't sure how I was going to do that. Um, so one of the elements of the sweater is that the ribbing is a knit to purl to ribbing um, that just hangs very straight. It's not very long and it just hangs straight. This is knit at a very fine gauge with more stitches than you have. They do some decreases as they transition. So there's, I, I wouldn't as a hand knitter probably be able to knit something that was that dense relative to um, the rest of the sweater. So I had to think about how I was going to do that. And the other element was that this was a, an interesting button band. 
It is not the same pattern that you see in the ribbing anywhere. We have knit to purl to ribbing at the pockets and we have knit to purl to ribbing on the hem. But this right here is brioche. And the buttonholes are sewn buttons. Uh, they're machine sewn and cut open, and they're done in the ditch of one of these um, brioche ribs. So that isn't possible to replicate in hand knitting. I would have to actually machine sew and cut the fabric if I wanted to replicate that. So it isn't, you can't do a vertical buttonhole in brioche. Um, if it's possible, uh, I just don't know enough about brioche. I'm not a huge brioche knitter. It's not really my thing. Certainly you can do them horizontally. Again, that would change the character of what this was. So I had to make some decisions about what I was going to do about these uh, stitch patterns and, and just, you know, what my approach was going to be. So I had a lot of uh, decisions to make about, about that. Uh, so another thing was when I tried this sweater on again, I realized how kind of large the sleeves were. So again, this is like 20 years ago. And this is something that I wear over other things. So I do, I don't mind it being a little loose. It's not meant to be form fitting, but I thought maybe I might want the sleeves to be a little narrower uh, than they were. So I had these kind of decisions to, to work out. How, how am I going to do all of this? So I wanna go through uh, some of the swatches that I, uh, knit at first. Um, the first was uh, simply to figure out how the cable was knit. So the original cable was 12 stitches wide and I believe um, the crossings were the repeat was about 16 rows long. So I am using a worsted weight yarn and I'm, I'm not, this, this swatch was not done with the yarn that I was intending to use for the sweater. It's just some leftover yarn I had um, and it's in a medium color. It's very easy for me to read what uh, the stitches are like. The worsted weight yarns I use tend to be very similar. I don't have to worry about gauge. I know what my stockinette gauge is. I don't tend to do a stockinette swatch when I'm using these very, very familiar yarns. I absolutely will do a swatch when the fiber is different, the yarn construction is different. Um, there's just something about the yarn that's very different from what I'm used to. Um, then I will do a swatch. So I was just trying to figure out if how this worked. And so I realized the original sweater was like four or four and a half stitches per inch and it was a chainette cashmere. So the fiber was different, the yarn construction was different and the yarn weight was different. So I needed to translate that to a worsted weight, which isn't that much different, it's a little bit thinner, but I did have to change the number of stitches that were in this uh, cable. And so I realized over time, okay, I needed to do 15 stitches wide and uh, 18 row repeat rather than 12 and 16. Um, so I figured that out. Then I wanted to uh, see if I could incorporate some red. Originally what I wanted to do was incorporate some red yarn that I dyed at a retreat. Uh, I wasn't completely happy with the yarn. Um, it's a little, it turned out a little bit it's tonal, which I wanted, but it's a little bit lighter overall than I really wanted. Um, and I wanted to maximize the use of this. And so rather than trying to find a way to use this in a stranded color work pattern, I decided to use it in a cable pattern. And I thought that I could use this yarn to do some of the cables or use this as a contrast in some way. Um, that was my original idea. So I started swatching with yarn that I had in my stash that was gray and red in order to see uh, what I thought of like an intarsia cable, um, in including that in, in one of the cables, either just on the front or one on the back or, you know, trying to figure out how I might do that and whether or not I liked the way it looked. Well, I liked it just fine in this yarn. So then I started working out the pocket issue. How could I create the pocket um, so that it was more balanced than what I had uh, seen on, um, on the original sweater? 
And I thought, what if I got rid of the ribbing at the top and that way I could have that additional crossing. Remember, there was only one crossing uh, in the original pocket. And then where there would have been this other crossing, you had the ribbing. And so I thought, what if I got rid of the ribbing, add another crossing, and then created the pocket in such a way that the, you know, had the, these kind of three stitches on either side coming around the outside. And then use an I-cord bind off at the top. And I also had an idea for using a, this kind of a, a full pocket. Uh, I don't I can't remember the name of this kind of pocket. This is a short version of it, it would be longer than that. Um, but to do that kind of a pocket and then have this I-cord bind off, which I liked, but it was too wide. And so I figured out how to adjust it so that it would be a little tidier. There's some uh, hidden decreases in these crossings right here that reduce the stitch count so that when I uh, do that bind off, um, it looks good. So I, I ended up with a result that I liked for the pockets quite well. And this would work in a mirrored version as well because you'd have these um, on both sides regardless of, of which way. Uh, you went. When I brought this sweater project out again a month or so ago, I decided to swatch with the two yarns I actually had, which is the re yarn that I had dyed at the retreat plus the actual gray yarn that I was going to use in the sweater. And I did not like the two together. I just did not like this yarn. So I had, I had a choice. I could either over dye the retreat yarn or I could just use a different yarn that I had in my stash, which is uh, this one, which I quite like uh, with, with the yarn. Uh, I, like the, I like the two colors together. I think they, they, uh, they work well together. Uh, and I also don't have any concern about, I need to use all of the yarn because this is a special yarn. I don't wanna waste any of it. I wanna make sure I use it all. This is just a yarn. I have several skeins of this. I can use as much or as little of this as possible and it doesn't matter. On to some more swatching and thinking about and, and wanting to do some calculations. So doing some swatching that wasn't on a pocket to actually get the full uh, measurements of, of these cables. And, and then once again, thinking about what I can do with that middle back panel of the sweater so that I can mirror the cables on the front and the back of the sweater um, and, and figure out what I could do. Uh, what I finally realized was I didn't have to use the same number of stitches in that central panel. I could do something different. So I was playing, I played with I think three or four different ideas. And finally I came up with this one and initially I was actually crossing these two ropes as they got to each other. And I realized that was uh, more uh, three-dimensional than the other cables were, and that was maybe bulkier than I wanted. And so instead, instead of having them cross, I would have them touch each other's. So rather than having a 15-stitch wide panel in the center of the back, I have an 18-stitch panel. And because there are two ropes that are crossing, that's causing this to pull in a little bit more as well. So that helps with um, offsetting the fact that there are a couple of extra stitches. So this is, this is what I have settled on at this point is that I can mirror them and I will use this, again, this won't cross like this at the, um, uh, when they meet, um, that this is what I could use for the central panel. I might also use this on the sleeves. I haven't decided. I actually have started knitting the sleeve. I had another idea. I'm not invested in using as much red yarn as I can. One of the things I wanted to do was just make the lining red. Um, and I could, but it's not going to be seen that much. And I thought, well, where else could I add a little bit of red without making it too much? Because you can go overboard with this. And I thought maybe at uh, the wrist cuffs that at the base of the ribbing just have some, um, some red I-cord around there. I thought about doing it along the edge of the bottom hem and up the button band, and I thought, nope, nope, just around the sleeves is enough um, for now. So I have cast on with the sleeve using a provisional cast on, 
um, and started the sleeve. I'm going to use uh, this idea for the sleeve, see how it goes, see how I like it. And, um, and then later I will come back to this provisional cast on and I will do an I-cord bind off in the round. So um, the, the provisional cast on method I used for this is to use a crochet cast on, but I only cast on half of the number of stitches that I need. And then uh, I double the number of stitches by doing a yarn over and knit one across all of those stitches. Um, and what that does is that when I pull this chain out, it creates a lifeline through the first row of those red stitches. Um, and then I can recapture stitches without having to try to unzip uh, a crochet chain and recapture as I go. I just prefer that method. So I have videos on this method of doing a provisional cast on with a built-in lifeline. And then I also have a video on how to do an I-cord bind off in the round and then how you finish that off. So I'm going to start off by doing a sleeve and see what I think of the stitch pattern rather than casting off for the entire back and having to do you know, additional uh, cables in order to see if I actually like what's going on. Uh, and ultimately I might decide, maybe I will put this uh, edging along the bottom hem. Uh, at this point, I'm, I'm not planning on it. I've kind of given up on the brioche for the button band. I thought it was really interesting, but because, uh, because these are machine sewn around, um, uh, and I and cut. I mean, you and you can feel how stiff it is. They probably put some kind of um, fray check on them so that it doesn't come out. That I would use something that's more standard for hand knitting, and I would do a, a button band that is perpendicular to the body of the knitting, and I would do that in the in the knit two purl two ribbing, which I have. Um, at the cuffs and at the at the bottom hem. So instead of adding, you know, an additional stitch pattern, uh, which worked okay with this when you had all the cables going one direction, you didn't have an extra color, that I would just um, uh, do that instead. So that those are the the design choices that I've made that I will be going forward with um, on my sweater. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.